Hey everybody, my name is Ed. Okay, so today we're going to do another deep dive, and this one's going to be Fantastic Four, number 245 from 1982, uh, written and drawn by John Byrne. It is cover price 60 cents, and you can see here, they got the little Candace Corporation logo on here. They used to own Marvel back in the... Uh, back in the early 80s for a moment. Okay, so, the invisible girl fights for her son, childhood's in, and there's actually some interesting uh, social sat or yeah, a little bit of satire here, so we'll get to that in just one moment. So today, like I said, we're gonna look uh, at Fantastic Four, 245 from 1982. It's written and drawn by John Byrne. It's still pretty fresh off his stellar run with Chris Claremont on the Uncanny X-Men. It's an issue that centers on Sue Richards and provides kind of a little heart-tugging adventure and a little bit of satire. Uh, but first, we're going to get into a little context. So, uh, the Fantastic Four was created by Stanley and Jack Kirby roughly around 1961 to be a different type of superhero team. Uh, so, they're more or less a group of astronauts who go into space and are exposed to cosmic rays and they gain superpowers. Uh, Sue Storm becomes the invisible girl who's engaged to Reed Richards, who becomes Mr. Fantastic. The other members were Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, and Ben Grimm, the Thing. A uh, few of the things that made the FF... Uh, a little bit different were the fact that they didn't have secret identities. Uh, Sue, the girlfriend, was in fact engaged to the hero instead of being the clueless kind of would-be love interest you saw a lot in superhero comics then. And originally, they didn't even wear a uh, costume, so I think that changed like around issue three or so. Sue uh, originally could only turn an invisible herself, but around issue 22 or so, she gained the ability to project force fields and turn other things invisible. Uh, so, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. During the Silver Age, uh, women's gender roles in fiction and comics were still pretty uh, strict. The damsel in distress trope was still pretty strong during the 60s. And it's not hard to find a little casual chauvinism in some of those Silver Age marvels. Uh, Sue fell a little too neatly into all of this. Uh, she was commonly fainting. Her powers were often not strong enough to face whatever threat um, was facing the team. Uh, and she needed to be saved. And then she was even spoken harshly to uh, by her husband. It's interesting that uh, even, uh, even in, the, in the early days, uh, young readers kind of noticed some of this and thought Sue didn't do enough. Uh, there's a semi-infamous story where I believe it was Fantastic Four number 11. Uh, the Fantastic Four read letters uh, from the readers, and they made a little story out of that. And but one of the letters they read uh, was from someone who said that Sue didn't do enough, and the team would be better off without her. Of course, the FF slash Kirby and Lee kind of repudiated all that, <coughs> but yeah. <laughs> Um, what else? Let's see here. Now, I think in 1965, Sue and Reed finally did get married. In some ways, people respected them, that is, in the, in the comic more. Except for Reed, there's a fair amount of get-out-of-my-face woman directed towards her from, towards, yeah, towards Sue from Reed. Uh, Sue actually left the team a couple of times in order to devote a little bit more time to being a mother, uh, but she always came back. So in the 70s, uh, Marvel made uh, some attempts to make their female heroes a little bit more distinct and prominent with various degrees of success. Um, there's not, there's a not quite infamous story where Sue asserts her independence by threatening to leave uh, Reed for Namor the Submariner. I'm not sure if this really was a help or a hindrance to uh, Sue. So second wave feminism <coughs> is generally thought of as from like, say, maybe let's say the 
late 40s to about the mid 80s, centering on issues like, you know, women's place and value in the workplace, uh, sexual autonomy, abortion, etc. Of course, this impacted pop culture in a big way and comics were no exception. Older female characters became a little bit more assertive, newer characters. Uh, were explicitly warriors, uh, were just as good as men were introduced. It's also worth m mentioning that um, there were even stories that mocked women's split as well. Interestingly enough, the introduction of Thundra, which happened in the Fantastic Four, of the Glamazons and Savage Tales, of the first version of the Lady Liberators and the Avengers. Uh, John Byrne had just come off an acclaimed run as an artist and co-plotter of the Uncanny X-Men, and he was gathering praise as the writer and artist of the FF for his kind of back to basics approach. He pushed a lot of nostalgia buttons, but he also brought in a lot of fresh ideas and imagination to the title. Uh, Burn broke into comics around the mid seventies or so and quickly became a fan favorite working on titles such as, you know, Iron Fist, although I think that got canceled before Burn really got big. Uh, Marvel team up, the Avengers, and of course, like I said, the Uncanny X-Men. So childhoods in, uh, well, the title childhood, in, it comes from an Arthur C. Clarke uh, science fiction novel, which I haven't read, uh, but Sue Richards uh, goes on a TV talk show and is interviewed by an aggressive female reporter who criticizes Sue for her place in the team, and Sue's still calling herself girl, even though she's a fully grown woman. Uh, Sue's son, Franklin, who has latent mutant cosmic powers, has turned himself into an adult and is causing havoc at the Baxter building. Uh, the other members of the Fantastic Four can't control him, but Sue... Uh, is the last person standing and it seems that she can and it's implied that it's her motherly uh, connections that finally get through to Franklin. Uh, the reporter here is kind of a spoof of Barbara Walters named Barbara Walker. Uh, so <clears throat> younger people may or may not know the real life Barbara Walters as the creator of the View television show, uh, but her legacy is a little bit greater than just that. Uh, the real life Barbara Walters was a very popular broadcast journalist. She had been in the industry since the 60s, was probably at her height uh, during the 70s and 80s. He actually broke a lot of ground for women in television and in journalism. And for what it's worth, there was a kind of famous boo for the character or sorry, a famous spoof of Barbara Walters on Saturday Night Live during the late 80s, or sorry, late 70s, called Barbara, Baba Wawa, played by Gilda Radner. So, <clears throat> during the early 80s, uh, conservative Republican Ronald Reagan was the elected president, and the moral majority uh, was a major force in politics and social movements in America. Uh, there was a clear pushback against the counterculture of the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a crave for nostalgia and traditional values, and there was kind of a pushback against radical feminism or women's liberation was part of that. So this is kind of the time or, or era in which this comic was published. John Byrne really leaned into the idea as uh, Sue as the literal and figurative mom of the group. Uh, she was a character that embraced that role and that traditional perspective. However, saying that, he made her a very competent mom. Uh, she wasn't the frail Rory Ward that she was in the Lee Kirby days. Uh, you know, again, she wasn't fainting all the time and what have you. Uh, when he was complimented on making the character more inter, uh, more independent and strong during that interview, uh, John Byrne said something like, all I did was give her a brain. So if Reed th told her once to throw a force field over there, she would remember how to do it and not have to be told again. Ironically, it was under John Byrne a few years later that Sue changed her superhero name from Invisible Girl to the Invisible Woman and was actually declared the most powerful member of the Fantastic Four. Okay, and just to show you some of the art here, we got a nice powerful cover here. Sue and Barbara Walters, or Walker, on the Woman to Woman show. 
having their little conversation it's interesting the layouts we get here because they're not super dazzling or anything like that they're actually pretty uh, uh, simple and straightforward <coughs> very much in keeping with <laughs> a uh, couple things uh, you know that so old Silver Age style that Kirby and a lot of other uh, guys would use and you still had that going on in the in the Bronze Age as well but you know you get your establishing shot then you get some medium shots and action shots <coughs> and then you might get the occasional uh, close-up for dramatic effect all right so just really just really solid straightforward stuff here and here Franklin is back to normal all right and we get Fantastic Four fan page. Alrighty. And a G.I. Joe ad. Actually, there's a G.I. Joe ad for the comic, too. And I think the G.I. Joe comic had probably just started. Here, they're advertising the fact that G.I. Joe has an ad on television. I'm not 100% certain, but this looks like Herb Trimpey art. Okay. Okay, so, um, all in all, it's not an earth-shattering issue, but it's a pretty solid one. We get some very good art with a decent script. We get some interesting characterization for Sue. In some ways, it's reflective of the values and politics of its time, but again, it's a solid entry that's part of a larger legendary run and a formative look at an essential, uh, essential member of the team.